Namaste. A very good morning to those in LA, a very good afternoon to those in Europe, and a very, very good evening to all those in India. Welcome to my Facebook Live session on the few talks that I'm going to give across the US in Los Angeles and New York this time on the two books that I have written. The Ramayan, translated from Valmiki Sanskrit, and Udnabhi, an overarching series set in the Mauryan and in future in the Sunga and Sakvahana times. So let me start with something about my own writing journey. I have always loved books. I have always read books. I was obsessed with books, but I followed a normal career path finished my graduation and post-graduation, and then I became an Indian Revenue Service officer in 1992. I worked as such for about 15, 16 months, and then took a sabbatical of two years to see whether I could write a book or not. The book emerged. The book was called Udnabhi. It was a tough couple of years looking for someone to publish what then was a strange book set in ancient India, set in a period which people were perhaps not that interested in, but I persevered. And I found uh, my publisher, Roli Books, the editor, Priya Kapoor, and uh, Neelam Narula, who have been partners with me in my journey on the path of writing. They have been partners, guides, and helps. And with Roli Books, I published two of these books, the, uh, the Ramayan and Udnabhi. And uh, uh, I'm also planning another book with them, which I will tell you about. So that's my strange journey. I resigned as an Indian Revenue Service officer a couple of years ago to concentrate on writing full time. And uh, that is a new step for me. Let's see where it leads me, because I have been a bureaucrat for a number of years. I have been, I come from a family of bureaucrats. This is a new step for me but one I'm thoroughly enjoying. Now, uh, that is a bit of a strange, uh, what should I say, introduction to myself, a bit of a strange career trajectory, but it has been an interesting one and it promises to be even more interesting in the future. For example, this series of talks that I am uh, going to be doing in uh, the US, let me tell you something about it. One, the first one is on the Ramayan, the Mirwar Ramayan. The LA Public Library and I have a kind of loose arrangement that I am part of their South Asian outreach program. And whenever any new book comes out, I come and do a reading or a session or something like that. So this is in the same series, my new book, the Ramayan came out in 2015. And so I am doing a reading on it. The interesting thing was when the Indic Book Club, the IBC, uh, we got in touch and they said that they wanted to do a tour around my series, the series which is called Udnabhi, the one which is set in Mauryan India. And Udnabhi as a um, symbol or an exploration or a rediscovery of what Indic women can be and are or could be like. So uh, I was, of course, very excited. It has been a product of my own journey of finding out what I am as an Indic woman, where I have come from, where I am going. So I was only too happy to say yes. So I am doing a couple of talks, one in LA, day after tomorrow, on Indic women. And the exact topic is... The Feminine in Indic History, an Exploration or Inquisition. That is a topic for New York on the 10th. And uh, for day after tomorrow, Los Angeles, the topic is the exposition of the powers of femininity in ancient India. So how I'm going to do it is that I will tell you first about my two books. And then I will tell you about the talks and hope that all those of you who are in LA or in New York on the requisite dates will attend. If not, I think there will also be a Facebook Live session of these um, uh, 
talks. So I think it would be easy for you, all of you, to just watch on Facebook. Why don't we take the help of technology when we can and make distances non-existent so that even if you're not there, you can still watch, you can still listen, you can still ask questions. And by the way, do ask questions right now. In case you have any question, please do type them and I will be, I will answer them as and when I go. Somebody has asked me, did you always want to be an author? That is a very good question. Perhaps the answer is yes. But in keeping with the way the trajectory of a normal Indian child goes, you study, you study hard, you take exams, you try and get a job as soon as possible. I followed the same trajectory. It was only very late in life. After 15, 16 years of service, after marriage, after two children, that I had the chance to actually do what I wanted. And it turned out to be that the period of ancient India, bringing out the past, showing people what ancient India was actually like by writing about it, since writing is my strong point or perhaps my interest. Yes, I think uh, I have reached where I wanted to reach in the sense of being a full-time author. So to uh, get back to uh, what I was trying to tell you, the first book that I wrote, Urnabhi, it was published in 2014 October. It is about a spy who works during the Mauryan period, just after. Okay, so there's another question. How did you get interested in ancient Indian history? Now, again, that's a good question. And this description of how I came to write Udnabhi will answer that question also, Dimple. Thanks for asking. So uh, I was, uh, as a child, perhaps a, a rather strange child because uh, I read the Tulsi Ramayana when I was 10 years old. I was interested in the Arth Shastra when I was about 14 years old. So the Arth Shastra has been my window or door or opening into ancient India. Since I had always been fascinated with it as a child, when I took a sabbatical and decided to write something, I thought it would be best to start with reading the Arthashastra and writing a story which comes out of it. So the Arthashastra has been uh, written by Chanakya and by all evidence that we have at the moment. It was written during the modern period. And it does describe to a large extent the uh, situation as it was during the times of the Mauryans. So it was a very small progression from there to researching the Mauryan period and then from there to researching ancient India and then from there to become obsessed with this whole uh, complete comprehensive bird's eye view and uh, of trying to understand what India would have been like 2500 years ago, 2600 years ago, 2300 years ago, how did Chandragupta Maurya, who is actually a very fascinating and larger than life and heroic figure, how did he actually come to be the Samrat? And uh, that took me further and further in my understanding and quest for discovering new things in ancient India. At the same time, I started learning Sanskrit through reading. So for the past 10, 12 years, I started with reading the Bhagavad Gita. It is not the easiest way to start learning Sanskrit. I had some background, of course, I had studied Sanskrit in my uh, in school. So I had some background, but of course, I mean, believe me, it is nothing like what the Bhagavad Gita Sanskrit is. But I read the Bhagavad Gita every day, sometimes for half an hour, sometimes for two hours, sometimes for three hours. And in so doing, I learned Sanskrit. And in so doing, I was interested in reading Sanskrit literature, Sanskrit poetry, prose, apart from what we would perhaps call the scriptures, you know, the Rig Veda, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, or maybe from later years, the Sondra Lehi. All the, apart from all these, I also read what would be, what's a bad description, but is called secular literature. So sacred and secular literature. I, I do not actually subscribe to these definitions, but for the sake of convenience. So when I read all this and the depth, the meaning, the grandeur, the beauty of ancient India, I felt it. And I felt that I had to bring it out in front of everyone, in front of people who had no idea what their past was like. I started living in the past and you can ask my husband, it's a very inconvenient place for
for your spouse to live in and uh, most of my answers most of my thinking most of my questions for my family my children and husband would all be as if i was living in the modern period not very interesting for them but then there it was so this uh, started me off on the discovery also a personal one as to what was it that an indic woman of that age was like how would she have lived what was her role what was her position in society as an indic woman of the 21st century this was of most abiding interest to me and of most uh, immediate interest also because was there something i could take from the past from the indic women of the past which could help me in my own quest for a future you know that we have a number of uh, problems today we have a number of issues women face a number of issues we are looking for solutions where is it that we can find them can it be that we can find them in the past so a melange of all these issues made me think about writing a story with a female protagonist this was very much helped by the fact that uh, in the modern period and in the arthashas women have a very definite and very interesting and specific role in many aspects of society and governance for example chandragupta maurya's own personal bodyguard consisted only of women again chanakya's arthashastra has a chapter on spies and women are the best spies according to him there is a long description of women spies etc and what kind of work they do what kind of work they do that so it seemed almost obvious that I, my protagonist should be a woman so was born udnabhi my protagonist is called mr kesi and uh, she works in the spy department of chanakya just after chandragupta maurya has ascended to the throne now when he ascends the throne naturally there are a number of uh, threats to be faced a number of fights war as well as covert fighting how she helps the modern empire to expand with the help of her chief her superior in the spy department who is pushyamitra sung about whom a little more later forms the basis of the story the story ends with the rajya abhishek of chandragupta maurya as the samrat of jambudvi this is book 1 this had this later expanded into a into a series so now i have just finished book 2 and sent it off to the publisher book 2 will look at the expansion of the modern empire into afghanistan because as perhaps you would know there was a clash of the central asian and greek seleucids with the morvians in the 4th century bc the details of that are found in uh, many of the many greek sources when the when the fog cleared chandragupta maurya was the master of parts of afghanistan and seleucus had retreated with the gift of 150 war elephants from uh, chandragupta so the second book will be about this expansion i am also looking at the modern empire through the eyes of the sungas the sungas were the empire which succeeded the mauryans in the north and the sakanas were the empire which succeeded the mauryans in the south both of these according to evidence had a role to play during the mauryan rule itself they were feudatories kind of feudatories of the mauryans so i have uh, and uh, they have been mentioned in uh, many many places you have puranic references to them you also have references uh, in megasthenes indica to them uh, the sungas and the satvahana so i have uh, tried to look at the growth and the fall of an empire through its two succeeding empires the sungas and the satvahana so it's a work in progress book 3 will look more in detail at it so this is as far as the udnabi series is concerned and through this historical look the whole idea of understanding and exploring the role of a female protagonist in historical progression has very much been there so this is as far as udnabi is concerned i will just take a minute to read a few more questions dimple asks me 
how long did it take you to reach a stage of proficiency in sanskrit it would have taken me at least 5 to 7 years see because i was not learning it uh, uh, with someone it was self learning so i had i used the tools which were ava- available to me i uh, read sanskrit i read hindi translations then i read sanskrit dictionaries then i read sanskrit grammar so it was perhaps not the best way of learning but then i didn't really have much choice because i live in geneva and I, i don't have any i couldn't have joined any classes later i did join a few correspondence courses which were helpful but most of it has been just through reading and uh, that is a very interesting but a very slow way of learning so it took me i, I think it would be at least 5 years i started about 10 years ago this whole daily business of uh, reading sanskrit and it would have taken me about 5 years to it and again today if you if i try to speak with you in sanskrit i would be an utter failure because i do not have any chance to um, exercise my conversational skills it's all reading so most of what i do if you ask me to read the bhagavad gita and explain it to you i would be very good at it but if you wanted to talk to me about today's events in sanskrit i would be very bad at it because i have not just not learned that so that is uh, very much on my agenda to go and maybe you know immerse myself in sanskrit and also learn conversational sanskrit another question is satyika asks me in the existing modern corpus of arts which works would you recommend as capturing the essence of indian heroines or women bahubali is widely accepted as an example of a suitable portrayal which other examples come to mind as a bahubali fan i am so glad somebody mentioned dev sena yes she is an excellent example of an indic woman a fictional indic woman just like mr kc my protagonist is a good example of a fictional indic woman other portrayals satya kam i would recommend that you wait for my next book my next book is called women of ancient india reflections or aspects of their life and i have actually selected i am in the process of selecting about 10 to 12 role models women from india's ancient past in very many different fields you know some of them could have been queen some of them could have been the mawadini some of them could have been uh householders and i am going to write about them and present them as role models for today's indic women so uh let me not do a you know spoiler for my own book i would hope that you would wait and see who are the women selected and uh, hopefully this book women of ancient india should be out next year and uh, satyakam i will definitely keep you posted and it will be uh, nice to see how uh, what you think about my selection of women and these women will be those mentioned in the rigved those mentioned in the upanishads especially the brihataranyak upanishad those mentioned in uh, some of the qurans those mentioned in history so wait for it it's coming somebody also asks me uh why do you think ancient history is relevant to today's modern world that is an excellent question that is the question of as to why i do what i do because i think that ancient history is very much applicable to our problems today now let us not think of it as going back to the past let us think of it as looking at the past and seeing whether it has anything to say which is of relevance to us in the present and in the future for for instance you know from where should women draw their power how should they conceptualize and visualize themselves what is their role in society and how should they conceptualize gender relations what should or what the relations as exist today between the two genders are not perfect can we look for something which would be a bit better can we look for a model which would be less aggressive more harmonious more in keeping with our indic tradition it is my contention and understanding that the answer is yes and not uh, just for women there are many aspects of ancient india and many aspects of ancient indian philosophy and uh, thinking and spirituality which is of great interest and great relevance to us today take the environment for example our ancestors were great 
lovers and protectors of the environment. We have lost a lot of it. Perhaps we can take some of it. So uh, the same goes as far as women are concerned. Women had a role to play, which was very uh, much encompassing all aspects of society. Again, I would uh, welcome you to read my book, Udnabhi, to read the series, and also to read the next book, which I am going to write, The Women of Ancient India, to understand the different roles of uh, women. Also, in the talk on, uh, on the 7th in LA, I will be speaking exactly about these things, why femininity was such a strong power and what were the different roles from which this power was drawn and uh, how did it play out in the sense of uh, routine common life, how did it play out in the molding of history. That will be the subject of the talk in New York on the 10th about uh, how, it, how did women contribute to the unfolding of history. I have another question from Nitin. Would you be shedding light on how ancient India Sanatan Dharma perceived this three dharma as well in your upcoming book? Yes, indeed, Nitin. I that is that is again the basic exploration that I started. How did Sanatan Dharma look at women? What was the role of women and in that's in English. In Hindi it would be as you were saying. What is, was the dharma? Is it of any relevance to us today? And uh, can we build on it for a better tomorrow for today's women? That is definitely uh, something I'm going to look at, not only in that book, which I am going to write, but I look at it in the Udnabhi series and I will be talking about it in both these talks on the 7th and on the 10th. And uh, as uh, planned perhaps there may be uh, some more talks a few months later i will be talking of this this is the one of the basic questions that i want to uh, address or think about in all the talks in my writings in my books and uh, let me mention something i read a lot of theory i read a lot of scriptures or books in sanskrit as well as prakrit i, I love prakrit literature too and i uh, read a lot of uh, you know, for example, if you read the Gatha Saptasai, which was written by a Satvahana king called Hala, you will be amused, entertained, informed. It is anyone who can get hold of it, just read a few poems and you thank me. So it's not just Sanskrit. Sanskrit and Prakrit literature give you some kind of um, pointers and understanding about how the role of women was conceived at the time. And I uh, read all these and I have a kind of theory in my mind. That theory is put into practice, according to me, by my fictional protagonist called Mr. KC. So that is how I want people to engage with something which may not be so interesting. You know, I doubt if most many people are very interested in reading the Brihadaranek Upanishad or, uh, you know, knowing what exactly... Uh, was the discussion in some uh, Shastra art or the other. That's perhaps not very interesting, but I try to put it in a more accessible way. So Urnabhi is my contribution to making the understanding of the theory of women more accessible to people in the form of popular fiction. So uh, Nicholas asks me, will you be able to shed some light on how much political power the queens of the modern dynasty held? Not sure if you have covered this topic in your work, but I'm curious to know. Uh, thank you, Nicholas. That's a good question. And indeed, I have not covered this in my book because my protagonist is definitely not a queen. My protagonist is a Ganika, a very accomplished and educated woman who, had, who was an orphan and who was sold into being a Ganika and has made a career for herself in that. So my point of view has been a little more uh, subaltern perhaps than looking at queens but your question is an excellent one and this definitely needs uh, some kind of uh, exposition perhaps so let me give you a few pointers the Arthashastra has a lot of description of all the small and big details of any kingdom so they also have a council of ministers and they have a series of 
salary steps to be given to each person in the council of ministers and indeed each person in the state and royal administration and you will be interested to note that the senapati and the queen are put on par with each other so they are the highest level earners or the highest and most prestigious positions in the court of the mauryans so it is small things like this which give you pointers on what role was played by the queens then again the queen was in the innermost advisory council of the king this innermost advisory council consisted of the king the senapati the purohit the chief minister and the queen so you can see that she would have played a great role in uh shipping events in the in the mauryan kingdom and in indeed in different kingdoms and to uh, go a little uh, deeper into it we find a number of inscriptions and we find a number of coins and we find a, a lot of archaeological evidence as to the importance and the role of queens they were granters of different rights in their own role they were uh, people who had the power people who had the uh, ability to influence events and uh, i am glad you asked me this perhaps in one of my future books i will keep this topic also in mind you know queens are a bit of an overdone topic so i i thought it would be better to steer clear of them but now that you say so perhaps yes it would be interesting to deal with it in one of the future series of uh, urnabhi so i have another question from uh, satyakam who says uh, you should aim to publish urnabhi and other works in indian languages indeed the plan is very much there satyakam in fact let me tell you that the original plan was for me to write urnabhi in hindi myself because i definitely want to write in hindi you know i am that kind of very unfortunate person who thinks in hindi and has to write in english and gets her wires crossed every time but due to already existing commitments i have not been able to find time to write urnabhi in hindi myself so maybe i will be in touch with the publisher and i will uh, get it translated if i can't write it myself yes i will get it translated not only in hindi we had discussed also uh, odia and uh, let's see let's see i i think that's uh, an exciting new avenue waiting to be explored and i hope we can go down it so hira hi hira asks me for suggestions for a modern english translation of the bhagavad gita i would say a modern english translation i don't know about modern but uh, you can read uh, aurobindo you can read shri aurobindo's gita or anything written in english i am not a great fan of english translations of the bhagavad gita i'm sorry but of uh, all the things written in english i think uh, shri aurobindo because he wrote it in english he didn't translate he was of course the mystic and uh, the understander of sanatan dharma par excellence and his gita i think maybe it that is the best thing i can think of so uh, right now there aren't any other questions so let me go ahead with uh, perhaps now uh, closing the session on urnabhi and starting on uh, the ramayan because uh, my talks are on both the books so this was as far as the urnabhi series is concerned it is of great and abiding interest thank you nicholas i am glad you like my answer and it would be uh, well wait for the space i hope to be able to uh, write something about one of the ancient queens but in fact if you if you attend my facebook live session on the 10th the new york session i will be talking about a few very interesting queens of ancient india including prabhavati gupta of the guptas and some others too so that would perhaps be Uh, interesting for you they are not from the modern dynasty but they are very much queens and uh, prabhavati gupta especially is i think a very very interesting case study on historical queens so catch me on the 10th and you may find out more about these okay so that's as far as the questions on urnabhi are concerned so let me move on to uh, the other book that i did which was of course uh, not a 
not an original book but a translation it was my pleasure privilege a, a dream come true to actually be asked to um translate the valmiki ramayan into a simple and accessible form for those who do not read these books i jumped at the chance when uh, pramod kapoor of roli books asked me if i would like to do it in fact i put aside some things that i was already doing and i took this on because i have a very special relationship with the ramayan as i told you i started reading it when i was 10 years old so i have a really special relationship with it and to do something which i would have loved to do and to see it come out in the form of a book was a dream come true so we started this project and uh, i read the valmiki ramayan again and try to make a simple free and accessible translation of uh, valmiki sanskrit ramayan i will be talking about this in my session in the la public library tomorrow and the beautiful thing about doing this was that it was published along with the mewar ramayan miniatures so in uh, this was in the 1630s that rana jagat singh of mewar set up an atelier called miniaturist and decided to get a beautiful pothi of the uh, uh valmiki ramayan illustrated and made for the royal family for the royal house so it took about 17 years a whole a whole atelier of artists led by hiranand uh, sorry no hiranand was the one who wrote it led by sahib din and uh, this all the uh, kaans of the ramayan were illustrated and about 400 odd paintings were made but these were this book was broken up and these were paintings were separated so again about 10 12 years ago the british library which had a number of these um decided to collect all these together and to put them together online so they have this uh, mewar ramayan online which you can see and roli books decided to put selected paintings along with the translation of the valmiki ramayan and my description and explanation of those painting together in a book so that is how the mewar ramayan was born and that is how the mewar ramayan came out and it has been one of the most wonderful experiences working on it and rereading the valmiki ramayan and you know every time i read it i learn something new every time i read it i understand feel something new something which i had not learnt in my last reading and it is well said that the epics like the ramayana and the mahabharat they are not about the novelty of the story they are about evoking certain bhavs in you so every time i read about uh, you know the vanvas for example that same sorrow arises or every time i read about uh, how you know one of my, i am a romantic at heart and one of my favorite uh, sequences in any version of the ramayana is a romance between ram and sita so every time i read about that it uh, gives a romantic in me a boost so for me uh, the ramayana is the full package i read it every time i uh, focus on new uh, things that uh, that i like and uh, learn new things and uh, basically i can i read it every day and i can keep reading it every day till whenever because it is something which never grows old for me so uh to translate this love into actually writing something into actually translating it and uh, putting it in the form of a beautiful book uh, you guys can google the mewar ramayan the ramayan with uh, sumedha varma ojha and jp losty is the co-author he's the expert on the paintings and you will be able to see how beautiful the book is how beautiful the miniatures are and tomorrow i am going to be doing a presentation on this i will talk about the valmiki ramayan the manuscript the script which version of the manuscript it was who wrote it as well as all the paintings and i will try and explain the whole concept of the ramayan the history of the mewar ramayan and some of the paintings yeah, i don't think i'll be able to do a facebook live I, i'm not sure about that but uh, maybe i will try and put up a video later if i can for all those people who are interested the other two sessions on the 7th and the 10th will definitely have a facebook live so do tune in somebody has asked me a question what is 
the pricing for the Mewar Ramayan and where in Delhi is it available? Okay, Satya it, it costs 2,995 rupees for the normal edition and well, 15,000 for the collector's edition. But you can buy the one uh, for 3,000 and it is definitely available in Bari Sons. If you don't get it in Bari Sons, ask him to get some. Ask Mithilesh Ji to get a few copies and he will get them for you. Or otherwise, it is also available on Amazon.in and I think also on Flipkart. Or I, I haven't checked Flipkart, but Amazon.in and Amazon.com definitely. Hira is asking me to post the details of my LA and New York talks. I will definitely do that, Hira, and do catch the Facebook Live because I think uh, the timing should be okay for you. And here, everyone, I am... Uh, it's very difficult to manage three or four time zones at the same time. I live in Geneva. I have audiences in India and I have audiences in the US. And to get all three timelines and time zones together is very difficult. So at some point of time, someone or the other loses out. and Or otherwise, I have to get up at unhealthy hours, you know. And uh, I just hope to be able to repeat things so that people in different time zones will be able to um, listen to me. It, uh, when it is comfortable for them because I may do another Facebook live for the people who uh, have missed this one after I finish the, the tour so then I will be able to talk about what happened what kind of audience reaction I got you know because that's also very interesting when I uh, give these talks across the world I face different audiences some of them sometimes a little skeptical downright hostile perhaps or interested and the inputs and feedback that I get from the audiences are very, very valuable because they give you sometimes totally new ways of looking at your own writings and books. Is there anybody else who has asked me a question? Okay. okay. So, uh, I have to summarize what has happened right now. I have this Ujnabi series where I focus on women and it is it will at the moment I have finished book two and I am conceptualizing book three it focuses on women in ancient India and from there comes the topic for my talk on the seventh the power of femininity and also my topic on the tenth women in history that is one part the other one is the Ramayana the Valmiki Ramayana and I will be talking about it tomorrow I had thought that I would keep this session to about half an hour. So it is now about 40 minutes. And uh, if anyone has any questions, it would be, I will wait for any of your questions. Or otherwise, I will wrap up this session. And I will hope to see all of you. If you are in LA or in New York, I will hope to see you and be able to talk to you in one of my talks. Otherwise, please do tune into the Facebook Live on 7th and on the 10th. I will be posting the details with the time as per your time zone, I hope, or you can just change it. And I will hope that you will be able to join me, ask me questions. I'm hoping that it will be a little interactive like this time so that uh, I can ask answer a few questions and get to have an interesting discussion with people. So uh, I don't see any other questions. Thank you to all those people who said that they will look forward to the 7th and to the 10th. I look forward to meeting all of you too. And I look forward to interacting with all of you and getting your inputs for my writings. Because remember, this is uh, especially the one on women is a work in progress. And I would love to know what today's Indic men and women think of the, think of what I have been uh, trying to do and what the theory and the practice that I'm trying to build about the, about the narrative for women. I am not at all satisfied with today's narrative around women and I am trying to look at it in a different way. I am trying to build it with strong Indic foundations and I would love everyone's participation in it. I would love to understand through everyone's eyes and there are people who will give me feedback which will help me to form up my own understanding. So I really look forward to that. Thank you, Mahua, and thank you, Ashish, for saying thank you. Thank you, Manish Jekli. I'm glad 
to like the session. I loved it too. I loved the questions. And I'm hoping to be able to do more and more of these Facebook Live sessions. This was my first and wonderful one it was. Thank you to everyone for making it so interesting and so lively. And I hope to be able to do this again. And you don't forget to tune in on the 7th and on the 10th. Thank you and Namaskar to all of you.